Here's one towards the goal. That's going to be blocked by Travis Ridgen. Well, this is more like it. This is Slang in the Biscuit. Here's Travis Ridgen and Dave Wheeler. Oh, man. That intro music. That intro music goes hard. It's good to hear that again. It's good. I like it. It's good. I, I like the comments last week saying, whoa, we thought this was a mistake. And then they didn't realize I was back. And here I am. And I got a new camera as requested. I don't know where the fault lies. The fact that the listeners think that I would make so many mistakes consistently editing that I accidentally put the intro in after all those weeks without you in. Or is Dave actually back? Regardless, I'm happy to have you back. Man, it's good. Week two. Wheeler's back. Let's go. Wheeler's back. Show your rack in the comment section. Yeah. 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 I'm back. I'm back, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm in Winnipeg. You're in Vancouver. And uh, this is the way it's going to be for the next little while. Now, listen, if you were on last week's show, uh, you promised that you were going to tell us about this mystery signing. Did you get the okay from your agent? And when are you going to tell us? I got two big hairy thumbs up because he got some fat, fat, thick thumbs. So good to talk about it. Nice. Okay. When? When? Do you, are you, we, we going to hook him through for a little while or are you going to come right out of the gates with it? What do you want to do? We're going to do about uh, 10 minutes. I'm going to get a couple notes to, uh, to go off the top of the show. But first off, I, I did want to say this because we were talking about this before we went live. As hard as the intro music goes, now that you're back, the Jack Black cover of Hit Me Baby One More Time, that had me vibing in the shower this morning. Man, I've been a fan of Tenacious D since they came out with their first record. Uh, Dave Grohl played drums for them. Uh, but Jack Black and Kyle Gass had been working together. Anytime Jack Black is in a movie, he's like, hey, is there any way we can get my buddy KG in this movie? And uh, he's been in a lot of them, including uh, High Fidelity, uh, managed to get him. Uh, he was actually, if you remember the movie Elf, uh, Kyle Gass was in that one. Uh, he's been in a handful of movies with Jack Black, but Kyle Gass is a very, very good guitar player. Jack Black is just very theatrical, and I haven't had a chance to see them live, but they're great, man. Like, they're awesome. They're just a two-piece. They don't take themselves too seriously, but they... They, they, they're big metal fans, and they rock. If you get a chance, go back and listen to their first album. It's really good. Even before we started recording, my, uh, my girl Bella, she was talking about Tenacious D. She loves Tenacious D. She's a bigger fan than I am, so you know she's a keeper, right? The D, man. They're awesome. And they, uh, the one you're making reference to is uh, they did a cover of Britney Spears' classic Hit Me Baby One More Time, which is 25 years old now, I think. And it actually uh, it plays during the closing credits of Kung Fu, uh, Kung Fu Panda 4, which Jack Black plays the role of uh, the main panda. Question. What makes you more mad than anything else in the world? Billy, you. Billy, we already gave it to me. All right, let's move on. You're tacky and I hate you. Billy, I'll see you after class. <laughs> what movie is that from? It's uh, School of Rock. You don't remember School of Rock? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, that's another one. I think Kyle Gass has a very short cameo in that one as well, but that, one, that one's aged really well. I love that movie. I think that's fantastic. What's, what's wrong with the kids? They, uh, they have a rare blood disease. What's it called? What's it called? Uh, stick it to the man. Oh, it's terrible. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's, uh, they actually reunited a few years ago. I think it was the 20th anniversary of the movie coming out. And uh, all the, uh, the original kids got together and played a show. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. By the way, the voice you hear, my name is Travis Ridgen. I'm stationed here in uh, downtown Vancouver, not too far away from Sunset Beach here on the west side of the city. On the other end of this call, Dave Wheeler. He's at the top morning show in the city, went back for over 20 years, stationed not too far away from the meeting of the Red and the Cinnabon River at the Forks in Winnipeg. And if you look live right now, I'll bet you if you look to the right of Dave's uh, setup in the studio, outside that window, you might see somebody getting the old Winnipeg handshake. I think it's the, the sun is set. No, it's oh, dark there. Man, the... That joke, that, that, that joke is funny, except when I read the news this morning and found out that somebody got the Winnipeg handshake right in the neck the other day. And there's, there's been a handful of them. Like, it's getting worse downtown. It sucks. I don't know if it, the, the weather's getting better or what, but yeah, it, it doesn't... Uh, I mean, Winnipeg's been the murder capital of Canada per capita for, for decades now, and it's just... Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, every city's got its warts, but it's just sad when... Especially when new new Canadians are coming into town and they're getting, they're getting the old handshake. It's, uh, it sucks. I know we joke about it, but like you said, it is sad. Yeah. It's like, like Canada's, uh, okay, so I know we had this mentioned for like towards the end of the show, but I am so patriotically Canadian. I love my country. I love the plains and the prairies of Saskatchewan, Manitoba. I love the Rocky Mountains. Even even the shield outside of Toronto, the Maritimes. Like we have such an amazing country with so many natural resources, so much beauty, so much potential, such incredible people. It's just a shame when like we're giving out drugs for free left and right. You got people in the streets that are committing crime left, right, and center. Nobody can afford vegetables, let alone to buy a house or to buy a home. And I think it's actually cheaper to order Uber Eats right now for 30 days in a row than if you were to actually buy groceries. It's it's scary. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping for uh, 2025 to be a big turnaround year for the country, but it's still going to take some time after that. What do you think, Dave? Well, we're a couple of weeks away now from the uh, carbon tax hitting uh, hitting homes, and gas prices are expected to go over $2 a liter. And 
Uh, farmers are getting uh, the the carbon tax, the drivers, the processing plants, the grocery stores, and it's directly driving inflation. Even the Bank of Canada said that, and it's yeah, man. It's um, and listen, I, I'm the first one to say I, I I love the environment and I do everything I can to try and take care of it, but you know, reaching into people's pockets isn't exactly the way to do it. There are there are there are better ways to do it. So. Yeah, it's been uh, th- 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 there's nobody that I haven't talked to that hasn't been, you know, tightening the purse strings a little bit in this country. And I know down in the States, it's not a whole lot different. So, yeah, I uh, I mean, a lot of people would say that's the price of liberty uh, when it comes to all of these uh, things, aforementioned things that you said. But I always treat uh, the prime minister uh, like the captain of an airplane. Um, I'm if I'm on the airplane, I'm not cheering against him. I wanted to try and land that plane the best that he can, uh, regardless of who's in there. But I uh, it's been a very turbulent ride thus far over the last eight years of Justin Trudeau. Nice hair, though. <laughs> Man. And you know what? You know what's funny is, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, I mean, down in the States, you know, they're going through the whole, are they going to ban TikTok or not? And up here in Canada, the, the Bill C-63 that's possibly going through where if you do any harm to somebody online and get them offended, you could spend the rest of your life in prison. Like, there's actual legislature going through the House right now that that, that bill could pass. I, I, I'm praying it doesn't, but yeah, there's some really wacky things that are going on now, and it's amazing how we point the finger at other countries going, oh, they're communist, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, but, you know, there's some things in both the U.S. and Canada, because I know there's a lot of, the bulk of our audience is here in North America, and it's just, yeah, it's something to keep an eye on, and I, listen, I, I know I'm in my mid-40s, I care more about it now than I did when I was your age, when I was in my mid-20s, but it's uh, it's more so as a uh, protective method for for my kids so they don't grow up with us as, be, as far as being the norm. But that's political stuff. We want to talk some hockey around here, don't we? We do. We got actually got a couple of shout-outs at the top of the show. Big Double D, Dale Denichuk, he's he's actually from uh, Fort Murray as well. He says, last week, the greatest trade deadline acquisition was not Trav for three hotel rooms and a steak dinner. It was not Connor Hellebuck for a massage table. It was Dave Wheeler. Back to the show. <laughs> He's from my birthplace up there in Fort McMurray, Alberta. So uh, I'll give him some love. Thank you, Double D. Much appreciated. And it's been a, it's been a minute since I've been back up to the uh, the old birthplace. But yeah, listen, man, happy to be back. Happy to be back. Also, uh, Rick Lowry donated sixty nine dollars last week to the show. What is he trying to say with that? Uh, listen, uh, Ross the Boss, as as he goes by, he's uh, he's a beauty. He's uh, originally a Manitoban, been working out in Alberta, and he. Loves the show, so big shout-out to him. He's actually coming back to see a uh, Jets and Flames games coming up here in about three weeks, and I'm gonna we're going to go out and have a couple pops and go check out a game. It's going to be fun. Shout-out to Rick. Also got a shout-out to uh, Mark and Jennifer out in Bakersfield, California. I posted a clip the other day. I don't know if you got a chance to see it, Dave, but Mark and Jen did these, like, custom McFarland figurines of me. So they had one from, like, when I was in Sweden and Barbary, one in Motor City, one in Watertown, one in Mississippi. The number one feedback that I got when I posted a clip too many puck marks in the Watertown set. You did not make that many saves. <laughs> you know what? It's funny. I um, I always wonder about those things. Uh, I always think that they're mass-produced voodoo dolls. So, you know, just be careful. My mom liked it. No, that's great, man. That's awesome. The uh, the bobbleheads, the the pump, uh, punk, punk, fo- no, Funkos, Funko Pops, Funko Pops. They're all cool. I like those. The McFarland ones, though, actually is funny. Where was I the other day? I was in a department store picking up uh, some odds and ends. And I went down the um, the athletic or the athletic department and just looking for baseball gloves and whatnot for my kids. And uh, they had the McFarland toys, and they they were all stacked. There wasn't even a price on them. I think you could just take them, but they were all Pierre Luc Dubois. There was like thirty of them, <laughs> all stacked up, dusty, half open. Nobody wanted those. Jets, Kings, Blue Jets. Jackets, what oh, was Jets, obviously, yeah. I think this is gonna be a new segment for the show. Mm. Brucey strikes again. What do you think last week of the photo of Rob and I? Oh, just extremely tasteful. Like I said, it was a wonderful uh, di- uh, diving into fantasy, and I, I, it was lovely, lovely. I'm sure it could grace uh, the, the the pages of Grinder. <laughs> well, there's a new one. Brucey strikes again, round two. He did up a photo of Dave and I holding hands on the beach, and wow, like you said, Brucey has some good taste. Shout out to Brucey, and uh, I think he's either in Regina or somewhere in the Maritimes. Brucey, please send me messages for an update. Next week, but man, the artwork that this guy does of us is outstanding. That's uh, there's a big difference between those two uh, areas of the country. I'm gonna based on the fact that he's Brucey, I'm gonna I'm gonna bet that he's an East Coaster. Here's a question for you though: Does anybody actually know anything about the Maritimes? Like everybody talks about BC through Manitoba, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, but then when you get to the Maritimes, nobody actually knows they exist. Oh, they exist. Th- Listen, that's one thing about uh, growing up in Fort McMurray, Alberta. Even though I've made Winnipeg my home for over 20 years now. Growing up in Fort McMurray, we had a 55% Newfoundlander population. There's a few things, and anyone who's uh, watching out on the East Coast will know that this is basically scripture. Um, 
You don't confuse a Cape Bretoner with a Newfie. You're going to end up fighting if you do that. Uh, whenever you say Newfoundland, you got to say Labrador because they're the forgotten ones, really. It's Newfoundland and Labrador every single time. PEI is like the absolute um, Valhalla of that area. If you're a golfer, PEI is your spot. Uh, Halifax, going to send a shout-out to Halifax. Beautiful area. You can get some of the best seafood right out of the water in that place. And then New Brunswick. And Donaire. Don't forget about the Donaire. Don't forget the Donaire sauce. Water it down. Stop it. Stop it with your Donaires <laughs> in Halifax. Water uh, down the Donaire sauce. <laughs> New Brunswick often gets forgotten, too, because it has more of the uh, French influence because it borders Quebec. So you've got a lot of uh, French speakers in New Brunswick. But each very distinct area. It's not just one kind of, you know, area. It's not just, oh, the East Coast. And they're all, all very distinctive cultures. All very distinctive languages. Even in Newfoundland, you've got different dialects. If you, you're from Come By Chance, boy, it's a whole lot different than if you're from St. John's, Newfoundland. St. John's has actually kind of really lost their accent. You really got to get into the, really got to get into the weeds when you, if you really want that, you know, authentic Newfoundlander accent. I've told everybody your analogy for when Quebec wanted to leave Canada and the Newfies got excited for a shorter drive to Toronto. Every time I tell that to somebody, they, they love it. Full credit to you. I don't give you credit at the moment, but I'm giving you credit <laughs> here on the show. That's okay. You run with it as long as you get the laugh. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, one last note about uh, Canadian stuff. Uh, I'm heading next week to uh, Calgary at the Palliser Hotel. I'm I'm so excited. I'm taking my missus for a nice little trip down to the Palliser. We're also going to the uh, Chateau Lake Louise in uh, Lake Louise, Alberta. Man, I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Well, listen, if you're, you're going to be driving in on uh, 16th Avenue, so you're going to pass by uh, University of Calgary, and then as you get closer to Center Street, uh, you're going to come up at the corner of 16th and 17th. You're going to come across... Uh, uh, the old University of Calgary, which is now uh, the Southern Alberta Institute of uh, Technology Polytechnic. That's my old, uh, that's my alma mater. Uh, spent two years there going to radio college from 99 to 01. It's changed a lot since I've been there, but man, I, uh, I, I literally watched that city grow f- over those two years. Like the amount of skyscrapers that they started building there was incredible. And I've got nothing but love for Cowtown. You ever seen the movie Accepted with Justin Long? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's the one where he's a uh, university. He starts his own university, right? Yeah, we're the South Harmon Institute of Technology. What's our team mascot? The sandwiches. The ma- the sandwiches? We're the shit sandwiches? Yep, we are the shit sandwiches. What was what was the one guy? We're dealing with some very potent materials. <laughs> what happened in there? An explosion of flavor. I'm working with some very unstable herbs. That's it. That's the line I was looking for. Thank you for jogging my memory. Glenn, didn't you have a job? I got fired. What for? Oh, I made a shrimp slushy. Why would you do that? I was hungry and thirsty at the same time. <laughs> you know what, man? Listen, I'm going to tell you something, and, I, and I've only found this out in, in, in the past five to ten years, but I used to be like you where I could rattle off m- movie lines like crazy. There were some movies that I had memorized after seeing them only a couple times from start to finish. The kind of memory that you have is going to waste by remembering movie lines. If you can actually start doing... No, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. If you can actually lock that mind into something like learning a different language, you would be able to master it within a couple of years. And I'm not lying to you because you have that photographic memory when it comes to something that you hear. If it registers in the funny part of your brain, you just got to train it a little bit. Sky's the limit for you. I was fully preparing for you to say if you could actually put that effort into stopping pucks, man, maybe you'd still be in the Fed and not at home in Vancouver doing the show, but that works too. Listen, everybody knows you've been putting in the time. Everyone's been watching the vlog. They know you've been working with Pascal. They know you've been sitting in lakes in uh, the altitude of Denver. They, uh, they, Everyone knows you're putting in the work. That same approach that, that you just mentioned of like uh, memory and, and, and working towards stuff, like I've been trying to put that in towards Muay Thai. The suitcase killer has really inspired that in me lately where i got to be prepared at all times. And, man, I've been working with some guys that have just been punching me in the face, left and right. I've been popping the nose. Dudes are way better than me. But every single time I'm going in and I'm learning and I'm trying to get better. And it's it's honestly like reliving hockey all over again. Because I think we talked about this off the show. With goaltending, we're working on like a 1% of the 1% details. But with Muay Thai, kickboxing, every single time I go in, everything changes. My whole game gets revamped and we're adding new things. It's fun. It's exciting. Oh, do you want to practice against somebody who's better than you or someone that's worse than you? Because if you're practicing with somebody who's worse than you, you're not practicing. You know what I mean? We gotta get in the cage one time. We gotta roll. We we talked about it a couple, maybe like two, three months ago. We we gotta actually follow through on this, Dave. Well, actually, it's it's funny you mentioned that because uh, it's been a long time. But I um I I have done a I, I wouldn't say I've mastered any of them, but I have uh, done a few different disciplines here and there. And there's a few that I've become a really big fan of, like really kind of offshoot forms of martial arts. And my my boys have taken jujitsu and uh, taekwondo. And I think it's really great to cross train with all that kind of stuff. As the UFC have pr- has proved, you can't just be a you know, a, a one dimension fighter. But if you look into something called the Casey method, it's K E Y S I. 
and it's absolutely brilliant. There's no wasted movement in any of this martial arts. Like, like one leads to another, a block leads to a strike, a strike leads to a block, leads to a takedown. It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. It kind of started, its origin started in, in movies and whatnot, and um, uh, the Tom Cruise movie, Jack Reacher, if, if you watch some of the fight scenes in there, you'll notice it, and Christian Bale's Batman also used it quite a bit. And it's just fascinating. It starts from a very closed-in spot, and it's very effective, very, very effective, but it hasn't really reached a mass audience yet. But uh, I, I've seen the videos of you doing the uh, the Muay Thai, and, man, those guys are tough as nails. I mean, their elbows are like knives. It's crazy. Oh, I think the great thing about Muay Thai compared to, like, gold is let's say, like, I'm, I'm working on my craft, I'm getting scored on, things aren't going my way more often than not. Like, it doesn't really affect me that much because there's no actual, like, consequence as opposed to, like, Muay Thai. If I'm making mistakes, I'm getting an elbow, I'm getting a fist, I'm getting a shoulder right in the face. And when, like, yesterday I was training with a guy who was a, a brown belt, BJJ, also training Muay Thai. This guy was probably about five foot five, maybe, like, 140 pounds. So, like, I got 100 pounds and this guy got way more reach. This guy was working me. He was waxing me. I must have eaten, I don't know how many off the nose. I was telling the instructor, I was like, can you please tell me what I'm doing wrong? Because I'm tired of getting hit in the face. Like, yeah, you're not blocking. You have to. <laughs> I was trying, but I wasn't doing a very good job. But it's on the spot. Like, I need to make that adjustment or I'm going to keep getting hit in the face, which I don't like. So I would highly recommend it. I think especially, you know, you and I talked about this at Christmas time with your boys. It's a great discipline to get them into learning this stuff and learning self-defense and learning a new craft and sticking with it. It's, and it's also something applicable. Like, I can't take goaltending into the real world. When I'm walking down East Hastings or West Cordova Street here in Vancouver, boom, right on the spot. When I walk outside of my Muay Thai gym, it's on the spot. We're ready, putting things into action. You know what? I, I, I don't think you give uh, hockey, and especially your position, enough credit. I mean, you got to have your head on a swivel at all times. I mean, uh, I, I've even found that, I mean, I tell my kids this all the time. I mean, my youngest one is very, he, he doesn't have great spatial awareness. And I, I, I'm like, dude, listen, you, you almost walked into the traffic. Come on, know where you are. And I think goaltending lends to that. I mean, I've walked around with you. You usually, I mean, even when we're walking through the mall, going to get a coffee or something, you have a really good spatial awareness, and that comes part and parcel with being a goaltender. Talking things out, knowing where things are, move the puck this way, move the puck that way. You're, you're able to manage things, and you're able to kind of weave your way through, especially being six foot five. It's not like you're, you can hide anywhere, so you have to be spatially aware. <laughs> well, I think both are like body chess. Like goaltending is body chess, trying to get hit right place, right time, but... Mixed martial arts is body chess with severe repercussions if you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, listen, I uh, I know if I remember correctly, you haven't dr had a goalie fight yet in the professional ranks. Am I accurate on that? I've been trying. The, the last year when I warm up, because obviously the goaltenders warm up at uh, center ice, I've been trying to talk to guys. Hey, if things aren't going well, would you like to fight? Okay, you'd like to. Well, would you like to just kind of ham it up for the crowd and give them a show? Like, do you hate my YouTube videos and think my podcast sucks and maybe you want to hit me? Okay, well, then we can actually go hard. Like, what would you like to do? And nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to go. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more because I know we had the Gibson, the Mrazic fight, which I really want to get into. Yeah. But speaking of which, though, I wanted to talk about this. Locker roomisms. Right? Like, Muay Thai, like, we don't have a locker room, really. A lot of other sports, you don't have that same, like, camaraderie, that same energy that you have in a hockey locker room. I always found it interesting being the goaltender. Whenever the team comes in, especially after the first, maybe even the second, and they, everybody comes in, you just hear, boys, goal is shaky. we got to throw pucks on the net. This guy's spitting rebounds out left and right. He sucks. Every time the team plays, every team I've ever played for, that is what guys are saying after the first period. So I can only imagine the other locker room. Guys, YouTube videos and podcasts blow. Let's throw some pucks at him so we can post them here, fellas. Listen, you're um, you're 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 creeping into a territory that I've had complaints about for a long time, and it goes a lot further than the locker room. I mean, I don't know why they keep throwing microphones in the uh, faces of athletes, asking them about how they think the game was, because you're getting the exact same answer every time. And every time somebody comes around who thinks a little bit outside the box, and I'm not saying I'm defending Sean Avery here, but at least he gave an interview that you didn't see coming. You know, at least John Tortorella. Will give you a soundbite that you'll use on the, the year-end countdown for decades to come. Like it's just it, other than that, you know, hockey players are they're they're just so careful, they're so safe. I mean, other sports do a really good job of kind of letting these guys be guys. I mean, NFL, I love watching their interviews. They're a lot better. Uh, NBA is even pretty good too. But the NHL is like, well, we got to get up there and go twenty more miles. You know, pucks to the net. Got to keep uh, keep our nose clean and uh, do our goalie a favor. And uh, you know, let's get up there and uh, see what happens. We can we can only control what we can control. I mean, it's the exact same interview every bloody time. And I know these guys are smarter than that, but they're so self-conscious that they're worried they're going to say something stupid and get absolutely ripped in the media that they just they just stay. It's like that movie with Will Smith. And just you know, if you're going to dance, stay. This is it. This is your this is your wheelhouse right here. Don't go outside of that. Everything will be fine. 
Don't you ever, ever do that again. You see me? Hands to the side. That was, uh, like the, that. that was the movie Hitch, right? That's the one I'm thinking of with Kevin James. Yep, incredible movie. I love when he's dancing with uh, Leg Recall, the hot girl, and he's sticking to it, and then she turns around and boom, he's busting out the move, he's doing the worm, he's doing the shake and bake, and then she turns around, hands right back to the side. <laughs> the only thing about that movie, the worst ending I've ever seen in my life, it's like they spent a good hour and a half building this beautiful story and then just flushed it. Keep my wife's name out your mouth. Oh, actually, you know what, I saw Dave Chappelle do a decent bit about that. He goes, I can, I can relate to both of those men. I, I, I'm at a point in my life where I am ready to snap on anybody who says something bad about someone I love. But the other part of me is the guy who's willing to take a slap and keep my composure and keep things rolling for the sake of the good. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it was really cool to see somebody be able to equate that to both sides. And, of course, it comes from the GOAT, Dave Chappelle. By the way, I'm going to be doing stand-up in uh, the spring. Ooh, where at? Rumors Comedy Club, the local comedy club here in town, legendary comedy club. Uh, so I'm going to be doing that in uh, – I haven't set a date yet. I'm probably about halfway through writing my set. So once I get a good solid 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to go up on stage and put it out there. Like Shakespeare said, there's uh, – Dying on stage is like dying a thousand deaths, and I've died on stage a few times. Man, there's nothing like bombing on stage. It sucks, but it makes you better. It's one of those things, again, you know, if you want to get better, you got to play against the best, and going out in front of a live audience instead of just hiding behind a microphone in a studio, big difference when you get that instant reaction coming at you, whether they're laughing or not, because I can write something down and go, oh, God, this is hilarious, and when it flops, oh, does that suck. Do you have a date on time yet? No, no, not yet. i got to finish it, and then I'm going to talk to the comedy club, and uh, I'll head down. I'm, I'll, I'll make sure that it's recorded so you can blast me on this show. Maybe we can do a live stream. I'll turn the Sling on the Biscuit Instagram on live and we can do that. No? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you nervous, though, in all seriousness? About what? About the show, about doing your first live show in a while. Always. And that's one thing I love about doing it is, I mean, uh, if the same way as, uh, you know, every time you strap on the pads and you go for a game, do you get a little bit nervous? Good, because the second you stop getting nervous, you should stop doing it. Because that's half the reason why you do it. You want that feeling. It's that indescribable feeling of having no idea what's going to happen. It's that, it's that complete desire and fear of the unknown. And I, and I love both moments of it. And like I said, I love it when I kill it on stage. And there's part of me that's like, I bombed. And that's okay, too, because I learned something from it. And I, I, get, I get a little bit nervous every time I crack a microphone, even on this show or on my radio show or wherever it may be. And that's what I love about it. It's the feeling of the unknown. Trying to put on a pair of sheath underwear for the first time with their incredible dual pouch technology and bamboo mesh. The presenting sponsor for the show, they have been since the day one. Let's tell you about them. Sheath underwear. You got to get a pair, and here's why. This dual pouch technology, it's going to separate your dick and your balls. So don't stick to the side of your leg. You're going to be comfortable, calm, cool, and collected when you're hopping up on stage for your first live comedy show in years. If you're going to play hockey, you're going to go be doing Muay Thai, day at the job, out the office, construction site. You need a pair of sheath because you got to be comfortable, you got to be cool, and you can't have itching and all of the sticking and the chafing that's not cool you gotta get a pair of sheath on where you can do so they go in the link in the video description you're gonna use the code biscuit 69 b-i-z-k-i-t 69 will get you 20 percent off the greatest pair of underwear money has ever bought purchased and ever will only from the team at sheath i'll be honest with you if you've been watching this show for as long as uh, i've been on it and you don't have your pal- yourself a pair of sheath underwear yet that's on you I, there's literally there's no more convincing i can do once you get it on you'll understand especially in ramadan when you're not eating or drinking all day you got to be cal- calm cool and comfortable can I tell you, I, uh, <clears throat> I'll preface this by saying I was uh, raised Roman Catholic, and uh, I've been uh, on a spiritual journey ever since I uh, stopped going to church. I'll save that story for another time. But um, a dear friend of mine who is a practicing Muslim, I've known him for the better part of 20 years, he was diagnosed with uh, Crohn's and colitis about 12, 13 years ago, somewhere in that, that area. And he was, uh, he's, he's been un, unable to participate in Ramadan, which is a really important um, a month in the Islamic faith. And this year he was really excited. And he said, he goes, I'm, I'm going to be able to do it for the first time in 13 years. And I said, you know what, man? I said, I'm going to do it with you. And he's, he's like, really? I said, yeah. I said, you know, it, it's always nice to have a support system. And so the idea is it's a, it, it's a cleanse of not only the, the mind, but of the, of the soul and, and the body too. And so from sunup, the sun down, there's no eating, there's no drinking, and then when the sun goes down, that's when you feast. But you're, you cut out alcohol, you cut out tobacco, you cut out caffeine, you cut out all of these uh, carcinogens that you have in your body. And I'm, uh, as of uh, this podcast, I guess I'm a week in now, 
and it, it's been a bit of an adjustment. And it's it's funny because uh, I have my my watch set to tell me when the sun's about to come up. Like, it'll give me a five minute warning. So I'll go in like I'm doing the morning show, and so I'll go and pound down a bunch of water, knowing that's the last water I'm going to get. And what's really interesting about it, and it's fascinating me now that I'm kind of in it, is that Ramadan doesn't fall in the same time every year like like Easter does. You know, like, like Catholics will do Lent, where they give up something for forty days and forty nights. And that, that falls at the same time every year. Ramadan moves with the, the lunar calendar, if, I've, if I'm not mistaken. And so it could fall in different parts of the year, which means you might be getting a lot more sunlight or a lot less sunlight, all depending on where you are on the planet. And especially here in Canada and the prairies, where in the wintertime, very, very short period of sunlight, where we get maybe eight hours a day. And then I mean, that, that would be an easier time to do Ramadan in comparison to the summer, where the sun comes up at like 5 a.m. and doesn't go down until 1030 at night. Oh, that'd be a grind. Let me ask you this. Do you find you're gaining more respect for yourself because you're being disciplined every day? You're doing things that are difficult to achieve. You're not eating. You're not drinking. You're sticking to it through and through even when it's getting difficult. I'm always looking for a challenge. I mean, I I, I love it. I, I really do. And and I may not be as into it as, you know, obviously I'm not as into it as somebody who really practices the Islamic faith. But I'm under the guise of under the umbrella of never judge someone until you walk a mile in their shoes. And so I, I'd, I'd heard about it. I was familiar with it, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to try it, I, and, and I'm, I'm really going to kind of commit to it and, and and do it. And so, if for for my buddy number one, uh, but number two, just uh, yeah, just kind of check one of those things off the uh, off the list. You know, just, yeah, yeah, I've done Ramadan, and who knows? I, I might do it next year. I want to see what the results are. I want to see kind of how my body reacts. I've done a bunch of different, you know, uh, fast diets as they call them. I've done the metabolic reset. I've done uh, Veganuary, where you eat vegan. I've done a whole bunch of these different wacky things. And th- my body reacts in different ways. So I'm only a week in, and I don't really have enough to enough data to give results yet. But it's a it's a challenge. It's an absolute challenge. And I know this is going to sound weird, but when I tell people, someone says, "Hey, can I get you a glass of water or something, or can I get you something to eat?" Or, "Hey, you want to try one of these chips?" I'm like, "Oh, thanks. No, I can't until the uh, the sun goes down." They, they look at me weird, and I go, "Yeah, I'm doing Ramadan." And I just love the dumb look on people's faces where they go. White people don't do Ramadan. I can see it, like, going in their head. And I just love that second of them going, oh, okay. And it just, I, I, I love making people's brains work just a little bit different. And even for a second, if they think, oh, I thought that was only a brown person thing. It's not. It's really not. So I, I love that aspect of it, too. Sometimes it's fun to make people think. See the reactions on their face, like you mentioned. Thinking is a good thing from time to time. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's very dangerous. All depending on where, yeah, well, listen, we talked earlier about the whole TikTok thing, and I think that's really kind of setting young people's minds in a certain direction. And we've talked about social media before, so we won't dive too deep into that. But enough time has gone by. Where are you playing next year? All right. Ready to roll? Drum roll, yeah. please, Dave. Unless you want another commercial break. Uh, no. Do you, have, <laughs> do you have the energy from not eating and drinking today? Can you give me a drum roll? Uh, but... Ladies and gentlemen, lads and ladies, children of all ages, gentlemen of the jury. I, Travis Ridgen, have signed a contract for next season. I am going to play in Spain. Hey, perfecto, muy bien, amigo. Hablar español? Sí, señor. Perfecto, cerveza, <laughs> todo, todo, amigo, cerveza, cerveza, cerveza. Oh man, seriously? What kind of hockey is in Spain? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. A little bit less than the Fed, depending on the team. But the team that I'm going to be playing for is Legrano in Spain. It's the 46th largest city in Spain with a population of 150, 125,000 people. Uh, and we travel to Barcelona as well. I think Madrid as well. It's an 8-9 to nine team league. And I'm excited. No winner. Let's go. Okay, I'm looking it up. Legrano City in Spain. I'm not Spaniel. A uh, city in northern Spain, south of uh, Bilbao. It's a stop on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela. La Cathedral of Santa Maria de la Redonda has a twin Baroque towers, an elaborate uh, facade, and an image attributed to Michelangelo. Wow. I'll throw some drone video up on the, uh, on the video version of the show just on top. But yeah, like the architecture, the, the visual beauty of the city looks incredible. Yeah. Obviously, I haven't been there, but at first glance, it looks awesome. Yeah, dude, this looks really cool. Okay, you're a bit of you're a bit of away from from Madrid. You're a bit of away from Barcelona. Y- yeah, you're. The good news is, it looks like you might only be I don't know, maybe an hour, maybe two hours from the uh, from the bay. That'd be kind of cool, dude. Spain, really? Spain? 
What kind of hockey is over there? I mean, like, give give me a. I'm sure you don't know because you haven't been there yet, but give me an equivalent of what the the level of hockey would be. It'd be FPHL ish, so it'd be a little bit better than the Fed or a little bit worse than the Fed, depending on what team you're playing. There's uh, there's one team here. They had like an NHL guy. Um, I can't remember his name, Dan something, Danny something. He played for the Lightning a couple years ago. They cleaned house this year. Then you have some of the lower level teams that would be a little bit less than the Fed level, but it should be good. I, I report, uh, I believe, beginning of October, and the season runs to about Valentine's Day, so it's a little bit shorter of a season, 25, 35 games, depending on with playoffs. And I'll put a video on the video version of the show as well. Uh, my exact living situation, the place that I'm going to be living at, it looks incredible, especially when you compare it to the uh, uh, some of the other places I've lived in my other stops in my career. It's kind of like the other guys with the uh, dirty mic and the boys. We're going to put some <laughs> D's and some A's and you're going to like it. <laughs> Thanks for the Prius. Uh, you, you showed me the video earlier. Man, that is a definite, definite upgrade. And wow. Um, have you had a look at their roster? Like, is it is it mostly Spanish players? Is it imports? I can't imagine that. I mean, I'm, I'm not calling out Spain, but I can't imagine it being a hotbed of prospects. Yeah, they got about four to five imports per team, and I'd be one of them. I think every team usually has about two to three Canadians, maybe an American, maybe like a Russian, someone like in that dynamic makeup. So, okay, well, listen, take it from me, a guy who spent a couple years down in Mexico, and I spent time in a city where that was not a resort town, and uh, English was at a premium. And I was very fortunate that I had French as a background growing up speaking French in school. And so it was, Spanish was a little easier to pick it up because they're both uh, Latin based languages. But just do yourself a favor. And, and as I talked about that memory of yours earlier, because of the way your memory is, don't learn words, learn phrases, learn actual phrases, like things that are going to be important, like uh, um, uh, uh, la cuenta, por favor, which means, can I get the check, please? La cuenta, la cuenta, por favor. Uh, it's a hotel chain in the U.S., right? La cuenta? La cuenta. Yeah, I, bl- I believe it is, actually. No, that's la cuenta. That's la cuenta. That's different. That, that, that's the five. I've said that on a few dates in my day. Waiter, check, please. Yeah. Check, la, please. La cuenta. La cuenta. Um, but whatever it is, make sure you, like, uh, donde esta is where is. Donde esta los baños. Like, where is the bathroom? Um, learn phrases instead of actual words, and you'll do yourself a lot more favors, and it'll be easier to pick up. And the people there, and again, I know nothing about uh, about uh, Lagano, but Lagrano, pardon me, Lagrano, um, but if you can at least show that you're putting in the effort, they will roll out the red carpet for you. Latino people, they're amazing. And I, I swear to God, I swear to God, if we're doing a show while you're over there and you tell me how good the gyros or the, the hot dogs are over there and you're not eating authentic Spanish food, I will fly over there and flog you. Dude, the frozen yogurt at Costco is outstanding. <laughs> you got to try it. <laughs> you are going to get some of the best food in the entire world. Do not squander that opportunity. Oh, I'm going to be hard on you the entire time that you were there. When do you go? Uh, beginning of October-ish. By the way, for the record, for the, I just want to say this on the record. As much as you may be able to knock my gold chain abilities, the podcast, the vlog, you cannot knock that I'm very open-minded when I go to a new culture. When I go to Sweden, I try the meatballs, I try the fika, the kenabule, I try all the things. I try the Swedish women, uh, the lingonberry sauce, all that stuff. I really I like to immerse myself because I want to experience it. If I'm going there, I don't want to live like a Canadian. I want to live like a Spaniard or like a Swedish dude, right? Like I've, I've been very immersed in those experiences to date. Okay, so I'm looking up the uh, the team, Millennio Lograno, Millennio. Is that, is that am I right on that one? Is that the team? Yep, that's the team. Orange and black team. So orange and gear, orange and black for uh, the next set. Looks like the uh, the Panthers is the uh, the name of the team. That's a great looking logo, by the way. Can we throw that up? People can have a look at that. That's fine. Okay, so I'm just looking at the roster here now. You've got uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six. Seven. Uh, looks like you got eight. Looks like you've got eight people from English-speaking countries. That includes uh, what looks like uh, England or uh, Ireland, maybe uh, the United States and Canada. And then you've actually got some Spanish-born players on this team. Cesar Rubio, perfecto. Jorge Ramirez. Oh, these are great. Miguel Dominguez. I love this, dude. I am going to convince the wife to come and watch you play at some point next season. This. Motor City, I could not talk her into it. We are almost in upstate New. We almost made it to Watertown. But I'm telling you, 
I think this might be the one where I can say, you want to go to Spain to watch Travis play hockey? I think she might be on board. Be honest, the whole was banging on the dumpster out back in Biloxi, Mississippi, was what stopped you from coming to Mississippi as well. You forgot about that part. <laughs> well, I think it was. I think it was the fact that you're only there a week. That certainly didn't help. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I was there for eleven days. Thanks for coming, Dave. Thank you, dude. I am so excited for you. I am so excited for you. I think this is really cool. Now, I I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. However, this is specifically in the contract that I've committed to this team in Spain. Specifically, though, if a team comes, let's say, in Sweden or in Norway or in a league where like the, the offer is higher, the money is more, I am fully allowed to do that. That is within my right. That team is going to have to end up covering my transfer card and a couple other expenses, but they're not going to hold me hostage. But as far as this actual Spanish league, uh, that's where I'm going to be playing is in uh, Lograno for... Uh, I, I don't even want to try to say... I have, I have such a big tongue, I can't roll my R's properly. I'm sorry, I'm not even going to try. Okay, well, they actually have an extra letter in their alphabet. They have two N's. They have an N, and they have an N with a little hat on top of it. So, um, for instance, a la peño. Eño. So it's more of like a high end rather than a, a low end. You know what I'm saying? You're running in Trailer Park Boys. Ricky, it, it's jalapeno. The G's it's, silent. It's jalapeno. I totally agree. I do need to work my Spanish, but if there is one thing I also need to do, it's the fact that I need to continue working with my therapist from the team at BetterHelp. Now, this portion of the show is sponsored from the team at BetterHelp, and the reason being is BetterHelp therapy is incredible. They are making therapy affordable and accessible in a way that's never been done before in the history of ever. It's as simple as signing up on your phone, laptop, mobile device. You sign up, answer a few questions. They're going to pair you with a custom therapist for your custom unique circumstances. Again, your marriage does not have to be in shambles. Your life doesn't have to be falling apart. We can all use a little bit of help from time to time. And by signing up to BetterHelp, you can get one step closer to that. I found the last seven to eight months, it has absolutely changed my life in ways that I never thought it would. And you can too. You go to the link in the video description at betterhelp.com slash biscuit. The code biscuit is going to get you 10% off your first month of therapy only from the team of BetterHelp. And thank you so much, BetterHelp, for being the second presenting sponsor for the show. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Hey, uh, you might want to uh, hit up Elias Thompson. I saw that he got released uh, from the uh, from the Rockers. Yeah, he's going to need some therapy, I think. Yeah, um, what, what, what happened there? I mean, it's a little late in the season to be dropping guys, isn't it? Man, you know Big Sexy's my boy. Obviously, I haven't been in touch with him as much this season as last season when you know we're seeing each other every single day at the rink. But what a great guy. What a stand-up guy. What a, a guy who endears himself to his teammates. I've never seen a guy spend more time after practice working on his skills, working on just being the best possible asset he can be for a team, and that team's management to just shit on him at every single opportunity they can. I can say this now because I'm not on the team. I don't really care. That dude would literally, they would they would turn the lights off in the arena. I'd be leaving. They'd flick the switches off. The lights would go off. They'd say, Elias, go home. And he'd still work for five more minutes, working on a shot, working on those first three strides. The guy was so dedicated. And as somebody who got to see that day in, day out, as, as much as he liked to have fun off the ice, on the ice, the guy worked harder than anybody else out there. And as one of my boys, I just think it's... It's disappointing how they, they treated him and that they gassed him like a month before playoffs. And they only were using him for fighting. Like he's actually, obviously he's not the best player in the league, but he's he's more than capable of playing in the Fed at that level. He works so hard. Give him some reps, give him some opportunities and get him in there. But uh, to my boy, Big Sexy, why is his name Big Sexy? He's big and he's sexy. Uh, also, he has a girlfriend now, by the way. I never thought I'd say that, but Big Sexy has a girlfriend. Shout out to him and his old lady. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, aside from being unemployed. Makes two of us here, by the way. But, uh, yeah, my boy Big Sexy. I love that guy. I hope you're doing well, man. Well, listen, speaking of which, and, and, and this will lead us into a couple other topics here, but there's a guy um, playing for the New York Rangers right now, Matt Rempe, who is an absolute beast. Six foot eight, chucks knuckles, got some good hockey sense, has already got a handful of points uh, in his first few games with the Rangers. And uh, that, that's what keeps you in the league. Fighting, because I mean, I know you've talked about Diamond Hands a lot on the show, and he's kind of made his way up through the ranks as a fighter, but it's the guys also, that can can actually... We, for a split second, though, can we appreciate the fact that I hype up Diamond Hands every opportunity I, I get, and then he goes on his podcast and wants to talk about how he wants to beat the shit out of me? Diamond Hands, I still love you. I just, I don't, I do not want to eat any Diamond Hands. That's all. <laughs> well, listen, Rempe is a, a, he's a, I think... It, he is what the Jets were expecting Logan Stanley to be, and he hasn't quite gotten there yet. But this guy is kind of like what you talked about, Big Sexy, with uh, with Elias uh, Thompson. He, he's willing to do anything for his team. He'll skate around with black eyes, and he'll fight again if he has to. He's just happy to stay in the league. And speaking of fighting, what is the NHL's problem with goalies fighting? Last week, I don't know if you saw the game, Ducks and Blackhawks, it was an absolute blowout, but it already gets five points, but Mrazek... There was a bit of a line brawl in behind Morazic and behind the uh, the Blackhawks goaltender, 
and he saw that one guy was kind of getting his ass handed to him a little bit, so he decided to step in. And as soon as that happened, Gibson from the Ducks, he gets he gets the wave, and so he puts his helmet up, starts shaking his stuff off, crosses the red line. As soon as he crossed the red line, you know he's getting kicked out of the game. Like, it's an automatic game of conduct. We know that. So let him go. The referees made a point of jumping in between him and Mrazek rather than dealing with the rest of the scrums that are going, what are you so afraid of? That Everybody loves a good goalie fight. It's in the middle of the madhouse on Madison in Chicago. Let him go. No one's going to get hurt. It's going to be fine. I totally agree. I think the NHL needs more goalie fights. Let, like Gibson's tried twice. Gibson this year with Mrazek and then Gibson last year with Copley. The guy's taking his gloves off. He's taking the uh, the wrist strap off too. Like so, if you're taking the wrist strap off your chesty before you have a goalie fight, you know what you're doing. So that is not a man that I would want to mess around with. But we need more goalie fights. We need more action. NHL is boring. You need more fights. Simple as that. Also, can we appreciate the fact? And I mentioned this at the top of the show. I've been trying to get into a fight last year, but nobody wants to fight me in goalie gear. Nobody. Listen, you're also six foot five. I'm in goalie equipment, though. I'm restricted. Although, they don't know that when I come down, I'm going to take that elbow, that wrist strap off, and then I have a totally free hand. But that's... Shh. <laughs> Write that down, ladies and gentlemen. Scouting report on Travis Ridgen. I, uh, I, I, I don't know why, but I have a feeling... I have Ooh, a feeling. Hold on. Do you think what? I can fight in Spain? Do you think I, I, can, I, I can fight in Spain? took the words right out of my mouth. I think you're going to get your opportunity this season in Spain. Travis Ridgen, no mochismo. No mochismo. See, <laughs> <laughs> si. uh, no angle, no angle, no angle. <laughs> Just call the guy Chico a couple times and see how that goes over for you. Chico, that's what uh, Bella and I call our dog Wally the uh, Corgi. Uh, Chico, he's short and long. Yep, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, listen, man, I think you're gonna have a blast over. And oh, speaking of goaltenders, let's send a shout out to uh, Freddie Anderson back after. Uh, a bit of a, a bit of a health scare. So Freddie Anderson had his first game back the other day uh, against I can't remember who it was. He was playing obviously he's playing for the Hurricanes, but first game back since November since he had blood clots, which is a huge huge achievement in and of itself. However, the Anaheim Ducks were in Winnipeg in 2015, and at the time I was trying to sneak into the Fairmont Hotel at the corner of Portage Main to meet NHL players, specifically my goalies. I didn't care about the Perrys and the Getzlavs, but I remember I saw Freddie Anderson and I just Oh, hey man. You are Freddie Anderson? Yeah, like, and he's got the broadest shoulders. I've never seen a goalie. Actually, no, that's a lie. Matt Murray and Freddie Anderson have the biggest shoulders I've ever seen of two goaltenders. But Freddie Anderson, yeah, man. Do you mind if I get a picture? Oh, uh, sure thing. Just uh, find someone to take the picture. He tells the manager of the hotel, the GM, hey, man, you mind taking this picture? And so not a word of a lie, Dave. The manager takes my phone, takes the picture like that. Come and on. And I'm like, N- no, because I know instantly. Like, when he does that, I know the photo's going to be blurry. And right away, because, like, all the media and everything are in the hotel with the team. So Freddie's like, thanks, man. Have a good day. Shakes my hand. And I don't want to be that guy who's like, um, hey, the manager just made the photo awful. Can we do another one? And I'll put the photo. I think I still have it. I'll put it on the video version of the show. It is so blurry. You can tell it's me. You can tell it's him. But that's a that was boomer. a long time. That, that's a boomer move. That That's the same guy that holds up an iPad at a wedding. <laughs> He's filming in the back with the iPad. Yeah. I think he got fired six months later. I can't remember what for, but he got canned. Because you complained about him. This guy takes horrible photos. I did not complain about him. He just got canned because he sucked <laughs> at his job managing the hotel. <laughs> uh, so listen, uh, welcome back, Freddie Anderson. Uh, listen, uh, blood clots at that age, that's a scary thing. So uh, happy to see you're back on your feet, no pun intended. Also, I wanted to give a little love to uh, Sergei Bobrovsky. I, I honestly Bobrovsky. think this guy is... I, I know Dave loves him. Dave's a big fan of Bob. I, I love Bobrovsky. Watching him uh, in the playoffs last year was incredible, but I always think back to Jay Onright, who used to do the old Officer Bobrovsky when he was doing Sports Center on TSN. Still is. Is he still working for TSN or has he oh, been yeah. canned yet? No, no, no. He's still there. Still there. Because they went down to the U.S. for Fox for a bit and then they came back, right? That was the story? Yeah, so that was uh, Jay and Dan. I've, I've told this story on the show before. I know I have. But, uh, anyways, yeah, Jay and Dan went down to the United States. They worked for the uh, Fox. And then they came back to Canada, got their own show in the evening. Uh, Dan O'Toole was let go by Bell. Jan Wright has carried on. And uh, still uh, still a good good friend to this day. Bell, let's talk day. Nothing goes better with mental health appreciation than unemployment. Don't even get me started on that company right I, now, no, man. I'm, They've I'm been sorry, pulling I'm some sorry. really, really, yeah, not impressed. Well, I think Sergey Bobrovsky is possibly the most underappreciated goaltender in the entire National Hockey League. No, he's not. Why. He's very appreciated. Here's why, Dave. Here's why. 
the fundamentals and the attributes of his game that make him good. So, for example, he never lowers his hands. His hands are always in position. They're always moving. They're always active. And think of it like as a fighter, as a boxer, right? Like you have your hands up. Sometimes they drop. It's the equivalent. Like your shoulders get tired. You're tired in the game. He never drops his hands. His hands are always super active. And when it comes to his post work, him and Vasilevsky probably have the best post work in the league. But I would say Bob is better because his anchor leg is always engaged. It's always anchored into the post. So you have the one leg down on the post. The anchor leg is driving you back, driving you forward. He's able to flatten out and pivot so quickly with such fluidity. Florida Panthers are tops in the league right now. I'm pretty sure they appreciate him a whole lot. Well, the people that maybe aren't goaltending nerds that don't necessarily appreciate him. <laughs> I think he's incredible. He's a great puck handler as well. Undrafted. Bob is definitely one of the best in the league. Up there with Hellebuck and Vasilevsky. And that's uh, that's my goaltending breakdown of Bob. He'll be up for the Vesna. There's no doubt. But I think my boy, uh, my boy Hellebuck's going to do it. Yep. I'm still going to wear his skin to my birthday party coming up in June. I forgot to ask you a question about your time at the Denver airport, but I want to do it after you uh, mention our, our uh, next sponsor. The story definitely could have used one of these. It's a team at Manscaped.com with their brand new Beard Hedger and the Lawnmower 5, the perfect tandem for you this spring coming into the summer season for beach season. The Lawnmower 5, it has 60 minute battery life. It's waterproof design. It's got different edges and different tapers to uh, do all your below the belt grooming, to put it nicely. And then the Beard Hedger, it's actually what I do for my beard every single week, twice a week I do, a little fade and tapering. I do a, a number 10 by the chin all the way down to a two by the sideburns. And you can get yours, you go to the link in the video description at manscaped.com, the code biscuit, B-I-Z-K-I-T, will get you 20% off and free shipping only from the team at manscaped.com. This airport story. You ready for this one, Dave? Yes, okay, so I had questions for you about the uh, the airport. Uh, did you dive? Did you know beforehand about a few of the uh, the wacky conspiracy theories about that uh, about that airport? Uh, no, please enlighten me. I haven't heard. Oh, about you these didn't know from the locals. Oh, no, nobody told me. Man, yeah, there's some wacky, wacky stuff, um, including the fact that they have uh, underground tunnels running, and some believe underground tunnels running all the way out to Groom Lake, which apparently is the new Area 51, where all the alien research goes on. And it's a drive all the way underground. And that's how they get things in and out without attracting too much attention. They can just kind of drag it from Groom Lake all the way into the Denver airport. Nobody's thinking twice about airplanes taking off. They just kind of scoot stuff in and get it out of there. There's also some really, really weird art that goes on uh, in there. And I know they've earmarked uh, money for uh, the building projects and whatnot, and they have art there. But there's just some really stuff where you kind of go, that's odd. And they have a, a plaque, and it's something about a like a new airport, a new world airport authority, which doesn't exist. And there's actually a plaque talking about it and mentioning it. And people are kind of like, wait a second. It's like, there's just some really odd things. I, 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 yeah, I got, I, I got questions. So I, you didn't notice any of that. I just noticed the issues that I had at the lounge. That was it. I didn't notice anything else that you mentioned. <laughs> what kind of issues did you have at the lounge? Well, Denver's the biggest airport in the entire United States. Air Canada works out of there. They fly to Toronto and Vancouver. You would think Air Canada would have a lounge, but they don't have a lounge. They'd have an alliance through Star Alliance with United or American Airlines. So I showed up early, as I usually do. I went to the lounge. They said, sir, can I see your ticket? I showed them my ticket. They said, sir, you can't come in the lounge. I said, why not? I'm a member. They said, you have to be a 50,000 miles member or above to get access to the lounge. I said, what? They wouldn't allow me in the lounge. So then I went back to the terminal, to my gate, and I was doing a little bit of reflecting, and I was thinking to myself, okay, now Back I'm... with the peasants. I literally was telling my ride, shout out Dom and Vale. I was making fun of the peasants. I said, you know, at least I don't have to be with the peasants in the main terminal. I get to have a nice coffee, some beans and eggs for breakfast. Maybe I get to watch some TV, get some work done, relax in a nice comfy chair. Oh, the good life. This is the perks. Nope. I got to sit in the regular terminal. No coffee, no beans, no eggs, no comfy chair with all the regular swells. And it made me think... I really appreciate my lounge perks. How many miles were you short? Because I got to imagine you're throwing stones at 50K by now. No, I'm not even close to 25K because I started flying a lot about halfway through last year. And I think I got to about 5,000 miles. And then this year, I think I'm sitting around 3,000-ish. So I, I still got a ways to go. You have to either spend a certain threshold or hit a certain threshold of miles to qualify for the uh, status. But that's on a yearly basis. But if you hit a million miles lifetime, you have a lifetime uh, access to all the perks so i got a little bit of a ways to go good because I'm, I'm i'm getting hungry we're recording this and the sun just went down about 10 minutes ago so i'm ready to go eat let's go all right i'll give you one last juicy story we'll call it a day and you can go eat so vancouver to denver sorry denver to vancouver 
Uh, I'm zone two boarding. I board the plane. Everybody else kind of rolls in. This lady rolls in beside me, and we're about to take off. And she answers the phone, and it's her divorce lawyer. And she's yelling right, like right beside me, like right here. If you're in the video version, I'm here in seat A, right by the window. She's in seat B, yelling at the phone for her divorce lawyer that she's gonna take everything from her ex-husband. He ain't gonna get nothing. He's useless. He's this. He's that. He's the other. And and I'm I'm listening, right? Obviously, I'm just like. Do -do 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 -do, just like filling up the window, mind my own business. I don't hear nothing. I don't want nothing to do with this, but I'm listening to every last little detail she's telling. <laughs> and so then I'm about mid midway through the flight, I, uh, I ordered my five coffees as I usually do. Actually, technically, I asked for five coffees. The lady said, I can only give you like three. She said, why do you need so many? I was like, well, I don't want you to come back. So why don't you just give me five? So she gave me three, came back, gave me two because I didn't have any coffee in the lounge. So I had to make up for the plane. Anyway. The lady beside me who was freshly divorced, she says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going for business. I have a podcast. I have a vlog. I was just playing hockey in Denver, etc. What are you doing? Well, I'm 35. I was divorced six months ago, uh, and I'm taking my husband to the cleaners. I'm going for a girl's trip. I'm reliving my youth. And uh, yeah, my two kids are at home. I was like, oh, who's taking care of your kids? My stupid ex-husband, he's taking care of the two kids, but I'm here to party and have a good time. I thought, oh my God, this husband, whoever he is, if you're listening to the show, you have dodged a bullet. Actually, no. She's taking the cleaner, so he hasn't. But yeah, uh, you're probably better off. <laughs> two things. Number one, this is an for the record, sixty-seven percent of stats are made up on the spot. But this one, I can guarantee you, one hundred percent of divorce starts with marriage. Number two, do you know why divorce is so expensive? Because it's worth it. <laughs> but you're happily married to Candace. Extremely happily married. I'm just saying, for those that have gone through it, worth it. <laughs> Speaking of words, uh, thank you very much for listening to the show. We do new episodes, Sling the Biscuit does, every single Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's 10 in the prairies of Winnipeg and Saskatoon. That's 9 in the foothills of Calgary, Alberta, and Edmonton as well, in Canada's most northern major city. And 8 a.m. here in the Pacific Northwest, here in downtown Vancouver. Thank you again so much for listening. Hit the subscribe button if you're on the video version of the show. Apple, Spotify as well. Leave us a review. Let us know what you think. And on behalf of my incredibly good-looking, ripped-and-chiseled, young, youthful co-host, David Wheeler, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.